grief is not bad. Um, we just have to learn how to grieve well. And that's really, that's hard work. Um, but I think it's, it makes for just a better process because grief will enter all of our lives in some type of way. And so trying to man, you know, find a way, um, to manage our grief, um, and to just explore it and like befriend it and let it actually come in the house and not suppress it, um, is just such, I think that is, that work is transformative in our society. Cause I think so many of us are grieving and this, and we develop maladaptive responses to that grief, um, that shuts down so many aspects of the rest of our life. And so I'm really passionate about if we can grieve well, in a lot of ways we can live well. Like we just need to learn how to make these our teachers, make grief our teacher. Welcome to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal your weekly gathering of Black women and femme spiritual leaders, teachers, healers, and medicine folk from across the African diaspora. I'm your host and guide, Laren Alta, medicine woman, teacher, healer, and mystic. My intention is to create a sacred and sovereign container for you to more deeply explore yourself and your divinity so that you can tap into your spiritual gifts and live your soul's purpose. Sound good? Excellent. Let's do this. You're invited to support the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal so that we can keep our lights on and continue bringing you all of the powerful conversations with Black women and femme spiritual teachers, healers, lightworkers, shadow workers, mystics, and more. So there are a few ways that you can support the work of Black Girl Mystic. Number one, you can make a monthly contribution and join the Inner Circle community on Patreon. Memberships start at just $1 a month. When you're a Black Girl Mystic patron, you get behind-the-scenes conversations, extended interviews, book club discussions, discounts on courses, and offerings not available anywhere else. Sign up to be a monthly Black Girl Mystic sponsor at patreon.com slash blackgirlmystic. If a one-time contribution is more your speed, that's completely welcome too. You can make your contribution at paypal.me slash blackgirlmystic. One of the most powerful ways to support Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal is by spreading the word. Tell your girlfriends, sister friends, good Judies, and anyone else that you think would enjoy these powerful conversations that we have on the Black Girl Mystic podcast. And last, but not least, you can subscribe and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Your rating makes it easier for folks to find us so that they can connect to the Black Girl Mystic magic as well. Thanks for being here, my love, and contributing to the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal. Peace and greetings, loved ones. Welcome to the 32nd gathering of the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. I am thrilled, overjoyed, excited, and delighted, as always, that you are here. So whether this is your first time joining or you've been an active listener since we opened our doors, I am so grateful for your presence. You are part of this divine community and collective, and it is an honor to be in this sacred space with you. Today, I'm so excited to introduce you to my friend, Zena Regis. We go way, way, way back, back into time. And by that, I mean the late 90s, turn of the last century. Zena Regis is a grief and resilience coach, minister, and spiritual care practitioner. She has worked in hospice and palliative care as a chaplain and grief counselor since 2012. Her training includes a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Agnes Scott College 
and a master's in divinity from Columbia Theological Seminary, where she was honored with the H.J. Riddle Memorial Award for Excellence in Pastoral Care. I love, love, love this conversation with Zena because we talk about so much, including grief, healing, death, and dying. These subjects and topics which are generally silenced or taboo or hidden in our current society. And I love that she works in hospice as a chaplain and grief counselor, really supporting people through their own end of life care and supporting the people who are here after their loved ones transition with grief and healing and restoration. This is a powerful conversation, especially in these times. And I'm very honored and excited to share it with you. Introducing Zena Regis. Zena Regis, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. I am so excited to have you here. How are you? I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> yes, I've been so excited about this conversation. Me too, me too. So I'm going to begin the way I begin all of the gatherings on the pod. Are there any ancestors, teachers, guides that you want to call in and name to be part of this conversation with us today? Oh, that's such a good question. I- I've been um, working on like, inspired by pleasure activism, my pleasure lineage mm. and resilience lineage. So I'd like to call in my ma- my grandmother and my great-grandmother, um, Mary and Bernice. Um, in here. Beautiful. Thank you. Ashe, welcoming them in. Mm-hmm. And what was little Zena like? What were you like as a little one? That's so funny. I was a, I was a handful like so the story the stories that my my parents always say I have an older sister who's 10 years older than me so my mom would say something like go my sister's name is Eureka go tell Eureka to do whatever and I would always have to add cuss words (laughs) it might be like go tell Eureka to uh empty the dishwasher and I'd be like Rika, mama said, get your ass down here and empty the dishwasher. And so my mom would be always be like, I did not say that. So they were just like, we don't know where you got all this extra spice from that you had to always add words that were not there. So, yes, that's how it was as a little girl. Uh, That's a little too much. That's hilarious. (laughs) I love that you were an embellisher. I love that you were an editor. You revised. I love it. You know, so we've known each other since college. Yes. Back in the day, you were at Agnes Scott College. I was at Spelman College. We had the Women's College of Atlanta connection. And I think if I hearken back, you were maybe the first person, first Black person I ever knew from Alaska. Ah, yes. So I came from the Northwest, Seattle, Washington. People thought that was a journey. And I was like, oh, no, no. My girl Zena got me beat. She came from Alaska. So what Mm. was it like growing up in Alaska as a black girl? Yeah, you know what? I and it's so funny because Seattle was always like the big city. So like when we were really doing something, we would go to Seattle. Like it would be like (laughs) high school trip, we go into the mall in Seattle. Like that was like going to New York City for us. You know what? I look back at growing up in Alaska and it was such a it's, people are always surprised. It was such a diverse place to grow up. Like people are like, what in the world? But I think because we had, a, I was a military brat. And so we had the military base growing up with indigenous Alaskan culture right there. And then people just from everywhere. So it was really, it was a great place to grow up. I would not <laughs> want to live there now. Uh, I'm just not cold natured anymore. I mean, I just don't want that cold anymore. But it was, it was really a lovely. And I think there's also something I was just listening to a podcast today about the Enneagram and they were like, and I'm an Enneagram nine, if that means anything, but that Enneagram nines love nature. Um, just, and so growing up in a place with so much majestic, beautiful kind of untouched wilderness was really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think that informed my spiritual journey in a lot of ways. So That's what I was going to ask you. How did that inform your spiritual journey? Yeah, I think it was always this like sense of awe because I remember like seeing the Northern Lights as a kid, um, 
just growing up around these mountains that were like enormous. So it, I, I don't know, it's something about, we used to, every summer we went to Denali um, and that's the largest, I mean, the highest mountain in, in North America. And so we would go there and see all these animals and uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, but it was something about like really seeing my place in the universe, like not making me feel bad or anything, but like, this is like, there's some mystery. There's some just awe. I think mm. it's the, um, and also like there are just huge, like it's huge. And so just the scale of it all was really something to see. And so that is the part of Alaska I miss just that, like everybody, I mean, it wasn't weird for black people to hike or like, yeah. you know, do whatever or hunt. We didn't hunt, but like a lot of people hunt or fish cause that's what everybody did. And so I miss that kind of just, expectation that you would be out in nature. Um, mm. you, yeah. I love that because being from Seattle, I also grew up camping. I also grew up skiing. Like that's all these things that, that I didn't know other parts of the world maybe had ideas that black, quote unquote, black people don't do this. And I was like, but we do though. <laughs> I do. And I know black, other black people who do. I'm not the only one. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that was us. We camp like uh, my spouse now is always like, what is this camping? Because I'm always like, we need to go on a camping trip. And they're like, uh, what is this camping thing you talk, you speak of? But like, we did that. Like, that's what we did. Exactly. It's not odd or abnormal. No. Uh-uh, not at all. So then how did you end up from Alaska to Atlanta? How did you know about Agnes Scott? How did you arrive there? Yeah, that's such a funny story. So I, my sister, I, my sister Rika, who I used to always add cuss words to, um, <laughs> she moved here to be with her husband at the time. And um, I just, so I came to Atlanta and Atlanta was like, I don't know, you know how all this, the memes are like self-transformation begins inside, not in Atlanta. <laughs> My little 18 year old self was like self-transformation begins in Atlanta. Like that's what's happening. And so my parents were like, I mean, all of my friends went to like UW or somewhere like even if they were leaving home, they went to like Seattle or California. They did not go to Atlanta. That's not, actually, that's not true. My best friend went to Spelman. So uh, we graduated together and she went to Spelman. But I was just like, we, we are going to Atlanta. And my, since my sister was here, I really wanted to come. And then um, my, I have a, a cousin, um, actually my father's cousin, um, went to Spelman. And she, as a little girl, she would always tell me like, you have to go to Spelman. Like Spelman is just where, where we go. Like you need to go to Spelman. You're a smart little black girl. Like that's where you need to go. So I came to visit colleges and my parents were like, we are not flying from Alaska to Atlanta for you to visit one school because that Mm. was like, all I wanted to do. I was like, I don't need to visit anywhere else. I'm going to Spelman. So they made me, we were going to be here seven days. They made me visit a college every single day. And so um, Agnes Scott got on the list. I don't even know how it got on the list, but it got on the list. It was my first visit and I just loved it. Something about it just like I got on the campus and I was like, this is where I want to go. And so all, I had planned on only applying to Spelman. And so just recently I was talking to my mom and my mom was like, where else did you apply? And I was like, nowhere else. And she was like, I'm so glad I don't know, I didn't know that then because I would have like lost my mind. But I ended up only applying to Agnes Scott, getting in and the rest is history. Oh, so. my goodness. That's a great story. I, it's, it continues, Zena, the revisionist. You were like. I know we were talking about multiple schools, <laughs> but what I'm going to do is what I want to do. So I'm yeah. applying to one. <laughs> and, I, and I thought she knew that all these years later. I've, it's, I've been graduated almost 20 years. And she was like, I did not know that. I would have lost my mind if I knew that. Like, how did how did you think that I knew that? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. But yeah, so that it was it was Agnes Scott for me. And I'm glad. I'm glad that I made that choice, even though I love Spelman. I told you my best friend went to Spelman. So I got to get on Spelman's campus a lot. But Agnes Scott is where I ended up going. I love it. I love that you went to Agnes Scott because I have a special place in my heart for Agnes Scott. I also think of y'all's squad as like the power squad because you would come to Sister Fire, which was a gathering that I started for all of you listening who aren't familiar. I started this gathering, monthly gathering at Spelman. And y'all squad would roll deep and come from Agnes Scott and Decatur to Spelman. And I just have so much love for you all and so much love for Agnes. Like, I think Agnes Scott, we're just going to go down a little rabbit hole here. But I think Agnes Scott is another all-women's college 
shows up in a way that Spellman doesn't. Like it really is so personable and holds from an outside looking in, it holds you all as leaders of your own experience, which I love. Is Was that true for you? Is that just my outside perspective? No, it was. I like, so after my like time of being a spicy, always cussing out somebody kid, I went through this really like painfully shy period. Like my whole middle mm-hmm. school, high school, I was just a shy, like, I, even my mom and dad are like, we don't know where that came from because you were so loud and boisterous as, as a kid. And I know a lot of the research says that that's where girls right at middle school like lose their voice in so many ways. And I and I think that was true for me. Like I knew I was I was smart and I could do school and I did that well. But anything outside of that, like I just did it. I was just shy and really timid and I remember my parents coming to visit me at like some parent weekend and they were like, you were not shy or timid anymore. We were like, where did that kid go? (laughs) And it was really, Agnes Scott helped me. There's an Adrian Rich essay about claiming an education. And Mm. she said like, girls should not be receiving an education. We should be claiming an education. And I always think about that, about Agnes Scott. Like it made me claim my education. And in claiming my education, I claimed my voice in so many ways. And so I will always be grateful of like, just that work, the work. And then like, like you said, the squad was just amazing. Like the folks I went to Agnes Scott with were like amazing. So they're still my friends. Like I still, I was just telling a a Scotty who just graduated because she was like, you know, some of the girls at Agnes Scott were blah, blah, blah. And I was like, there's not a day that goes by 20 years later that I don't talk to someone in some way that I went to school with. Like Mm. we're either in group texts, we are on Facebook commenting on like, Every day I'm, I'm calling like we are we're just connected 20 years later. I love it. It speaks volumes. It yeah. really does. Ah, the quality of human that you all are and that Agnes cultivates is just remarkable. You have a lifelong fan in me. Oh. <laughs> yes, we are. We have a we are a mutual admiration society because I mean, every woman I know that went to Spelman is dope. So, oh. hey, I love it. I love it. <laughs> So then you let you finished Agnes with your political science degree and then got your MDiv, your Master's of Divinity from Columbia Theological Seminary. Mm-hmm. Why did you choose to go to seminary? What was that choice for you? Yeah, it was interesting. And I always joke that I'm the most heathen person that probably went to that school um, <laughs> because it wasn't an obvious choice for me. Even one growing up, like we were Christian, but we were also like... Let me not let me not go too far for, for my mama or daddy be like, no, that was not true. But we were uh, we went to church on since I was a military brat, we went on the military base and there was a Protestant and Catholic service. So we were just Protestant. Like that was all like we didn't have a denomination. I didn't even know about denominations, So I went to Agnes Scott because I was like, oh, we're Protestant. Mm. Um, and so I grew up with and then also just and because of that, I think because it was such an ecumenical understanding of church and Christianity, like we were in one little pot with like Episcopalians and uh, Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans, Mm. everybody, Presbyterians, everybody was kind of just doing their own thing, but we all like came together. So that's what I, that's kind of the mix I grew up with. And then um, I went to Agnes Scott and I just didn't go to church. (laughs) I was like, what is is this? Why would I go to church? Um, But I've, I've always been really interested in how, but I've always considered myself a very spiritual person and very interested in how we, how our spirituality informs how we show up in the world. Mm. Um, And my first job out of Agnes Scott was a community organizer and I was um, a congregation based. Like my position was working with churches to get them engaged in living out their faith in public policy. You know, so like it would be like, what are the things that are in our communities that we're angry about and how can we come together as as faith communities to change them? I loved that work. And the part I loved the most was like being like, you believe this. So how does that show up in your world? Mm. Um, And so I realized people were like, who is this little girl coming to (laughs) preach to us about how we should be showing up uh, in our faith? Like, I'm like, y'all believe in Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Like, (laughs) what would Jesus do about this? Um, And actually, one of my supervisors at the time was like, I think you should go to seminary. Like, uh, that's, you know, you... (laughs) you really have this passion for justice and spirituality. And so 
I did, you know, and I, I like it's something that came over and over again. And then I applied and I went. And so mm. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I figured I would not be a pastor in any traditional sense. But I um, I knew it would be something because I'm like, I the way we cannot be- just believe our belief has to be enacted. It has to be practiced some type of way. And like, how can we use these beliefs that we have to like inform our spiritual practice um, and make a better world? And so I was like, I don't know what that's going to look like, but that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do, set out to do. And so that's that's how I ended up in seminary. And now you are a chaplain. Yes. And you yes. do pastoral care. So how has that invo- evolved and informed how you show up because I hear this through line of holding the space, witnessing people, telling the truth, letting people have their own experience. And let me ask it this way, actually. What is it like <laughs> to be doing pastoral care in a pandemic and be a hospice chaplain in a pandemic? These are different times than when you started seminary. Totally. So that's such a good question. So how I kind of the journey to chaplaincy was my first I had an internship in seminary, you have to have an internship. And mine was as a prison chaplain. And I loved that work. There was something Mm. about um, showing up to people who like in churches, we know how people believe for the most part, like what their kind of overarching faith background is showing up as a chaplain you have no idea and Mm. I like that um and so it was really challenging in that way I mean I love anything that challenges how I think about something and so showing up with these women I was in a women's transitional center for the most part and showing up with these women who had in so many ways just been victims of state violence um relational violence and also just them processing all that was happening spiritually was really just, it was a gift for me. And Mm. I think it made me grow up really, really quickly um, and get out of these like Pollyanna visions I had about life. And so Georgia in all its wisdom was, so that's what I had decided. I was like, I want to be in like prison chaplaincy forever. Um, But Georgia cut a lot of, cut most of its chaplain positions. Oh, wow. Um, and so my supervisor at the time was like, I just see you as a ho- I see you in hospice. You're just really good at sitting with people in like liminal space and mm. um, helping them transition in different ways. Cause it my I was the reentry chaplain. So I helped people who were about to transition out of prison life back into the free world. And so she was like, I kind of see that as a skill set you could use in hospice. And at the time I was like, that's either gonna be really good or really bad. (laughs) No idea like how it was going to go, but it turned out to be really a gift in so many ways. Like I love hospice work because I do, there's so much, I mean, one, we're all going to die, which we don't like to (laughs) think about, but we're all going to die. But there's something about like sitting with people in that really holy and sacred time of transition. Mm -hmm. And People, I always imagine that like, A, you know, we see on TV these hallmark deathbed reconciliations and changes and all of this. For the most part, that's not how life works. People mm. people die in character. like pe- and, and that's affirming to me. Like for the most part, who you are, who you live is who you are when you die. And so people are hilarious. They're ridiculous. They're amazing. They're infuriating. They're spiritual. They're who they are. And so being with families in that space, and I'm always honored that people allow me such at such a tender time that they allow me in their their homes and in their hospice rooms because they do. And it's just so that has been a gift. Um, And but the pandemic has changed a lot of that. And it, it actually has me transitioning into more of the work that I'm doing now because I realize that because our healthcare system is so broken in so many ways, the part of chaplaincy that I love is being with people. And so quickly I realized when that was taken away, the paperwork, the politics, all of that really got Mm. difficult. And our mutual friend, actually Whitney Peoples one day was like, I've never heard you, because people always were like, how do you stay in hospice? How are you? Um, how do you do this work? Aren't you sad? And I would always be like, no, people are amazing. Like people are resilient. Mm. 
the resilience that people show is really inspiring to me. And so when I look through the lens, not of like death and sadness, but of like resilience and love and hope that gives me, you know, that energizes me for the work. And so I've I've started taking on more independent clients just around Mm -hmm. because I just need the like, I need this, I need this sitting with people and um, helping them grieve well and die well. Like that's, that's the work that I feel really, really called to do. And you were saying Whitney said something, but you didn't. Oh, oh, Whitney was saying, I've never heard you this burnt out before. Like she was like, what's going on? Like you are really burned out. And I've never, ever heard that from you. And and I I had been doing that. I've been doing this work now uh, almost a decade. And she's like, I've never heard you, you know, express burnout. And it was just like in the pandemic. And that's when I had to like get quiet and like, uh, get my guides and my ancestors and God together to be like, what's happening? And it's yeah. like, you're not being fed in the way that, you know, the work that, and that's the people that's sitting with, with people. So I want to talk about what you're doing now with this grief work, which is so powerful and, and amazing. But before we dive into that sweet little pool, I want to ask about how you hold your own grief. Or if you have the grief that comes up being in hospice and being a chaplain in hospice, do you grieve? Do you mourn? Are you impacted by other people's deaths? Like what does, what is your process around it? Yeah, it, so I'm really grateful for like spiritual teachers all throughout this journey who, who have like been very intentional. Like you got to care for yourself. You got to take care of your spirit. And so that first and foremost has been like my main, like this, I do this work. Um, and that's how I sustain it. Um, and so I do one, I of course grieve the individual people that I get to be in relationship with who are just wonderful. I'll tell this quick story because I was just writing about it. I had this patient who I just loved. Um, and he was for, I think he was a crotchety, like old man, but I just loved him. And one day, like, and everybody was like, oh, don't go, don't, don't go talk to him. He's so hard to talk to. He had spent a, a lot of his adulthood in prison. Mm. And then he gets out of prison finally. And then he has this terminal illness. And he's like, mm. you know, he's really, really angry at God. And then, I, but he, we start, we just del- developed a rapport. And he would let me visit. And um, we just, he was always inappropriate. Because he would always say <laughs> stuff like, how you a chaplain and you got all that ass, like all kind of stuff. And I'd be like, sir, why are we doing this right now? But anyway, but one day- I love him already. I just, <laughs> I love a curmudgeon, grumpy old man who has a mouth on him. That's my favorite. He, me, me too. And everybody would be like, how do you love him? Like you do. And I, I just, I just do. I did. And, um, one day he just got so quiet and was like, I just really, something's been in my heart. I really got to talk to you about it. So I'm really thinking we are going to be talking about some serious like life, death, reconciliation type stuff. And then he's like, ah, Zena, do, do you think there's going to be weed in heaven? <laughs> he was so serious because he was like, I'm not sure I want to go. If there's not going to be any weed, like, we got to talk about this because we had just been talking about, I was like, you know, you know, I don't really believe in heaven and hell in the traditional ways, but you are going to go to heaven. You're going to go to where you're going to go to the, the beyond and you are not going to go to hell and all this stuff. And so he's like, I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> There's not going to be any weed. So, but anyway. What did you say? How did you respond to this question? <laughs> You know what? It was so funny. Like, first I laughed and was like, that is really doing a lot. (laughs) But then we went through the whole, like, we got in this whole theological conversation about if we thought Jesus would smoke weed and, like, what are all the, like, leaves of the trees that they talk about in uh, the Bible? Like, it became a whole, like, it became a whole thing. We had a whole Bible study about marijuana that day (laughs) because he, we talked about scripture and maybe Jesus being okay with, I mean, Jesus probably being okay with weed, like yeah. not maybe, um, like he was probably okay with weed. Mm-hmm. And so it's like it, those conversations. Uh, yeah. I love. And so those patients, I always just like, I have a hard time. Like, and it's funny. People in my life are like, girl, you in hospice, they going to die. Cause I'll be, I'll come home and be like, I didn't realize they were going to die. <laughs> and they're like, 
<laughs> but you work in hospice, like that's what you do. Um, so yes, I have that. <laughs> I have that grief of like, but I always like there are little things that I really do and like for a while I was keeping a like vase of rocks where I would rock write their names mm. on rock and put it on a vase. Just like I felt like I needed something to remember because I really believe so much of like in the idea like so much of our legacy and is is in how we're remembered and so I just feel like my part is remembering and mm. so I, and I really started writing a lot too just so I could remember like I want to remember all of these people and these souls that are like that have been here and who are part of the, our great uh cloud of witnesses you know mm. so that so that individual grief, but then also there's been a lot of, I have a lot of grief around our healthcare system. I mean, just that is what it is. Like I, I've worked, I worked at a hospice that served primarily black patients um, for a long time. And a lot of us were dying untimely deaths, not because of not, I didn't feel like it was because it was our time, but because we were being mistreated by the healthcare system. Mm. So that's kind of my major grief there is like, just, we got to do something. So I think it harkens back to my community organizing. Like I got to, I got to figure out what we can do to like help people ab be advocated for in this healthcare system that just doesn't care yeah. um, because it would be people who have, who would quote unquote have done all the right things. Like I had this symptom. I went to get it checked out. They sent me home with Tylenol, you know, for mm -hmm. years and years and years. And now I have stage four cancer. Like it's that those kinds of things that I think I grieve the hardest for is like and knowing and, and at the hospice I worked for, too, we had a large population of black men who died from complications of HIV AIDS. And like I'll go in other places and people are like, people don't die of AIDS and HIV anymore. Like, you know, like mm. that, you know, people. But it was like black men in Atlanta are dying in their 30s, um, late 20s, 30s, 40s um, from complications from AIDS. Like it just, and seeing that up close, like seeing that, like I have colleagues who've never seen that. Mm. Literally never seen that. Like my white colleagues are like, who live, who serve hospices in, 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 in Atlanta, you know, in the richer areas, the richer suburbs have never seen a patient die from the complications of AIDS. And then our, my inner city hospice, we will have six, patients who are all young people with HIV AIDS. So that kind of stuff is where, where my grief comes from. But part of that is like, I'm like, I got to work, you know, being as active as I can and working in those issues and also just riding through it um, and keeping myself well. Yeah. Do, is it that they were not receiving the medication, they were not receiving treatment, were they undiagnosed? Why, what is the cause of the, I mean, we know systemic racism, right? We know medical yeah. apartheid, we know these things. Yeah. And, but how does that show up? Like, what does that look like in hospital and hospice? Yeah, so it's, it's a combination of all those things, not getting diagnosed, not getting the, the right treatment, not getting the medications that they need. Also, it looks like internalized homophobia, so mm -hmm. not, seeking any treatment until it's way, 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 way too late. And so it's a lot of that. And then also being like a lot of these patients were already on the edge, like not like homeless, dealing with homelessness, dealing with, you know, just basically trying to survive and then having, you know, having these medical issues, realizing they, that they, you know, I probably should go get treatment, but just not having the resources to do it. Um, or not even wanting to being in denial about what, what it could mean until it was way, way too late. And I think even for me, I say now, like, oh, uh, I have these people in my life who didn't know that this was still happening, but like, I didn't know it was still happening. Mm. You know, I, you know, I didn't realize that this is what, what, what it looked like. And I remember at one point I worked in a hospice unit that had 22 beds. And I remember there was one week where literally six of them were black men who had complications who were dying from complications of HIV and AIDS and I was just like this is not like I would have never thought that that, that would be happening in this metropolitan city you know across wow. the street from a major hospital you know with an infectious disease program so wow 
It's heartbreaking, really. Yeah, it really, 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 really is. I'm so glad that you have been and continue to be a presence in the way that you are, because I imagine that dealing with all of that where it might feel the world is mounted against you, to have a listener who can hold space and help move the process with such love and care and compassion, such as yourself, Mm. is invaluable. Like you can't measure that. You know, you can't put a price tag on it. It's like soul food, heart food. It's what people need more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is always what I try to be. I want people to feel like I, one of the things that I've learned in this work is that you can't like when I first entered chaplaincy, I wanted to make people feel better. Mm. Um, And that's not the work. The work is making people feel heard and witnessed. And so I'm always like, if I can do that, if I can create a space where people feel heard and witnessed and safe, that's my work. And so I'm really grateful. I'm always grateful that people allow me in to do that. And like one of my, um, not to get all bogged down in stories, but this story, I just always think about it. It was um, a young man and he had del- developed pneumonia as a complication of AIDS young. I think he was 23. Oh. And um, his mom didn't know about his diagnosis, his friends. And so the, by the time they found out it was too late and they had to transfer him to an hospice unit. And so he had like this group of maybe 30 young people who came to see him and to be with him as he died. And um, his mother though, in her wisdom told me, I felt like a bouncer. She gave me, I had a basket and she told me to tell every, take everybody's cell phone. Cause she said, I don't want anybody recording this. I don't want their last memories of him to be him in this hospice bed dying. But Mm. I I want them all here, but I do not want to see this on Facebook or Instagram. Like, please don't. So I I took everybody's um, phone. um, And, but what was beautiful is no one gave me any grief about like taking their phone. And it was just such a holy time that we were able to create like a prayer and singing And so that young man, even in his untimely tragic death, like he went out with singing Mm. um, and prayer. And it was just, it was really beautiful. Um, And he had a really beautiful death because of that, like surrounded by the people he loved, surrounded by his chosen family and his biological family. And he left this, this earth. And it was like, those kind of things make me, are like, that's why I love hospice work. Oh gosh, that just got me so teary. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I'm here for all the stories. So thank you for sharing that. (laughs) It's like, because the way our society is set up, it's so hyper sanitized and it's not actually hyper sanitized because you, I mean, in Seattle, I don't know what it is like in Atlanta right now, but Seattle, there's tent cities everywhere. Like there is a very large unhoused population in one of the most economically sound cities in the country, right? Like there's same with San Francisco. There's like this huge unhoused population and a lot of wealth. So when I say sanitized, I don't mean that like actually it's sanitized. It's just like the way we don't see birth anymore. We don't see death anymore. They're, They're just like pushed into these corners. So your stories revitalize our relationship with the full life cycle. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I I totally agree. I think I just picked up this magazine and the headline was the future of death care is feminist. Mm. And I love that. And the whole article was about how like we have sanitized death so much and like how it's women bringing it back. Like I love I loved it so much. So Mm. I love that. Thank you. And last question before we transition, Uh, because I'm like, I would could stay here and talk to you about this all day. (laughs) But I know that we have more to talk about. How is hospice care handled in this pandemic? Is it possible? Do people still show up in person? Is it virtual? What's happening? So they do. You can to some extent, but a lot of it is virtual, done virtually now. And that has made, I think that has made it really, really difficult. And just because our society has such this very unintegrated view of who we are as humans. So it's always like, The essential care is that of nurses and doctors. Um, The unessential is social workers and chaplains or anything else. And so for so much of the pandemic, we chaplains um, have been deemed unessential to, Mm. you know, to the death and dying process. But 
lately I've had a lot of my colleagues say, we need you back. Like, I don't, you know, like the, the work that you do is actually in a lot of ways more, not to say more important, but I've had nurses say the more important work is that of the spiritual and emotional, you know, than that because the medical care in a lot of ways is, is symptom management, which people need, but like the spiritual and emotional care is the transform transformative care and can mark a difference between a, a good death and a bad death in a lot of ways. So, so that's hmm. been the, that's been the tricky part of being a chaplain in the pandemic is where, you know, not especially facilities and hospitals not really letting us in to to do any spiritual care work so doing it virtually which is a lot so much of what i do is about presence and just the holding the hands and you know like being that human touch that it's been more difficult to do it virtually mm. yeah yeah it makes total sense i'm i'm curious what the difference is between a good death and a bad death yeah. So for me, um, yeah, that's a really good question. But in many ways, a good death um, is about having everything taken care of, like not having all of the um, kind of the worries about the logistics of death. So having being able to be whole and present, like whoever is your circle of support having them be able to be present at that bedside without the concerns about pain and discomfort, which is a main, a main thing, but also like without the concerns of like, how are we going to pay for this? And like, how is, um, what happens to the body after, you know, after you die, like all of those things. And so I've become really passionate about helping facilitate conversations about like, what can help you be most, most present with your loved one at the time of death? Um, what can help them feel the most peace in leaving this world? Um, because so often, and especially um, Black folks, I mean, for so many reasons, but we don't have wills, we don't have advanced directives, we don't have a lot of those things. So people are making decisions on the fly trying to do it authentically um, and with integrity, but it's really difficult to make decisions for another human. So even the, even the, for another adult human. So even the little, not, this is not a little conversation, but even like burial or cremation, like I'm amazed by how many families have never had any conversation about that. And so that's hanging over the death. Like, you know, we don't have the money to have a traditional burial, but I don't know if they were okay with cremation. And now I don't want to bring it up because we're so close to death. And that seems like I'm rushing their death. And so now I'm just stressed and I can't really be present to provide the emotional and spiritual support because I'm worried about how we're going to pay for this funeral or I'm setting up a GoFundMe because I hadn't, you know, because of this, or I'm arguing with other people in the family because we have completely dueling ideas of what, what should be done. So I just, it's amazing to me, like how, like a few conversations. And I think it's back to what you said about a sanitizing death and not like trying to put it in the, you know, away in society and like not talking about it. Um, another thing that makes for a good death is I really am convinced that if we look through a lens of joy and justice and pleasure, like a lot of wonderful things can happen. And so as a chaplain, one of the questions I always ask, like, especially if a, a person is like due to medication or disease progression is unable to communicate, I'll ask their family, like, what do they love? Like what senses, senses do they love? Sense do they love? What feelings, like, what do they like on their skin? What music do they love? And so often we don't know that about our loved ones. And so I'm always encouraging people have conversations about like those little things, like, because I think that can make for a good death. Like I know, you know, my loved one loves Chris sheets and citrus smells, and I can put a little taste of raspberry on their tongue. And I know that will delight them and like all of these things. But because we don't have conversations about these things, people don't know, like, They'll be, and I've always, what I always tell my family, so what happens 
too often is people will have on the TV because they're just very, they want to be distracted. So like people will die with like CNN on or something. And I always tell my family, I will come back and haunt you if when I'm dying, you have CNN on the TV. Like that's <laughs> unacceptable. <laughs> like this is, but like, that's what happens. Cause I'm like, what, what is your, what is your big mama love? Like what music like makes her feel, brings her pleasure. And they'll yeah. be like, no. Um, mm. so, that, so that's why I'm just like, conversation is so important about these really hard, but also when we look at it through this lens of joy, what brings us joy, what will be just and what is pleasurable, I think it, it, it really can help us have good deaths. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I think so much of what you're naming around why we aren't doing this and the riches that come from it are the similar to why we don't talk about grief that happens after death. So I want to t- hear about your work as a grief recovery specialist and helping guide people through their grief journey, because we are not in a society that honors grief, names grief, centers it. Like, it's just like you got someone died two days and then get back to work. Where's your productivity? Get it together. You know, it's like, so talk to us about grief. Yeah, I, uh, um, that's been so much of my work lately. And I'm really, really grateful just to, to be able to name my own grief and help people name theirs. And so I really love the work of Miriam Greenspan. She has this book called The Healing Power of Dark Emotions. And um, she talks about like, suppressed grief being so much of the reason that we're experiencing so much anxiety, depression and addiction. Um, And that like, there are no negative emotions, just unskillful ways of managing them. Mm -hmm. And so that has really become kind of like the mantra in my work. Like grief is not bad. Um, We just have to learn how to grieve well. And that's really, that's hard work, but I think it makes for just a better process because grief will enter all of our lives in some type of way. And so trying to man, you know, find a way um, to manage our grief, um, and to just explore it and like befriend it and let it actually come in the house and not suppress it, that work is transformative in our society. Because I think so many of us are grieving and this, and we develop maladaptive responses to that grief that shuts down so many aspects of the rest of our life. And so I'm really passionate about if we can grieve well, in a lot of ways we can live well. Like we just need to learn how to make these our teachers, make grief our teacher. And so... I just, in hospice, I was like, we work so much with people who are dying, but then like there's this really imbalance of helping people grieve. And so it just kind of set me off on this like journey of how do I help people grieve well? And then around the same time I started working in hospice, my sister-in-law died unexpectedly, Mm -hmm. um, very young, leaving her children. And so I'm raising my nephew Mm -hmm. um, who was grieving his mother. And so I'm like, I got to help him grieve well, you know, Mm. like he shouldn't have to deal with this grief at this age, but he is like, how do I serve as a friend, a companion, a good old auntie to help him grieve well? And so he actually inspires so much of my interest in grief work because I really was like, we got to do this. Like this is, so he's my teacher about grief Mm. in some ways because I'm like, we, how can we, how can you grieve well? And I think especially not to get all stereotypical, but I think especially for men um, and, and young men, anger is a more accessible emotion than like sadness and despair and fear and grief. And so even just helping him articulate, like one of the exercises when he first, when we first adopted him became like, are you, is this sadness or is, is this anger or is this sadness? And when we were really able to talk about it, a lot of times it would be sadness. So that made me be like, how many times are we thinking about this as rage or dissatisfaction or anger when it's actually grief? Um, So that's what I try to do in a lot of my grief care practices, help people name, notice and honor what they're feeling so that they're able to process it and move forward in a way that seems fit for them. I love it. So if someone's listening to this conversation, they know they have some grief. Maybe it's even disguised as rage or anger. Mm -hmm but it's there and they have no idea how to drop in and access it. And it caught, maybe it feels terrifying because often it does. If you don't have a relationship with it, what do you want them to know? 
Yeah, that's such a good question. I think the most important thing to know is that grief is normal and natural. Like it is. It's it's a normal and natural response to loss. And grief doesn't always have to come from a death of a loved one. Um, that's that's more most often how we talk about grief. But like actually with my nephew, I um, had always imagined my life with lots of biological children. And I, um, I have endometriosis. And so I'm, I, I have dealing with infertility, but it was help. It was actually him who helped me name that that is grief. Like, mm. this is cool. And like, you know, my life is good. And I like, you know, what I'm going by. But like, it's, it was really, for me, getting in touch with that grief and like, naming it, noticing how it was showing up and honoring it so that I could actually move on um, and move forward in a way that felt good for me. And one of the most important things, like what I start with, with all my clients is kind is lay labeling the emotions, like not in a, not in a scary way, but like what is actually talking about what is coming up. Mm. Because I think we underestimate the power of like, sometimes like we'll have something covered up And once we actually uncover it, it's not as bad as we thought it was. But all the energy we have for like walking around it and not trying to um, deal with it can actually, you know, be the thing that's setting us, you know, back. But when we actually name it and say, this is what it is, and then setting space for honor it. And and a big piece for me, too, is ritual, setting rituals around it. So Mm. and creating and crafting rituals that actually help us to process loss. I just went to this talk and it was so powerful about grief. But one of the things it said is that you can tell how well a society grieves by the rituals it has around grief. And Mm. I was like, we don't have any rituals around grief beyond a funeral. Um, So it was talking about all these like breakups, divorces, miscarriages, um, Mm. you know, jobs all these griefs that we have that we net we have no rituals marking um and Mm. so we don't get any communal support around it um we don't even really name it as grief because we're taught like you don't even get the bereavement leave for these griefs that's right that's right you don't even get to so there's nothing there um so i really really try to help all my clients and anyone i'm talking to like what is what would a ritual look like around these things for you and like Mm. how can we do that so Mm. Zena, I love this and I'm loving this conversation with you. I could stay talking (laughs) with you about it all day long. (laughs) So for those who are listening, who want to continue the conversation, who want to work with you around their own grief, who want to dive deeper with you, how can they find you and how can they work with you? Yes, 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 yes. I would love it. I, um, they can find me at my website. It's zenaregis.com, Z-E-E-N-A-R-E-G-I-S. Dot com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at xenajane.com. So um, yes, I would love, 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 love to work. And I am, it's, it's all for me. It's, this work is so important that I'm all about making it accessible and affordable. And so I, that's who I am because I don't, I think everyone needs community and a friend and a companion to gently na- help them navigate their path if they're struggling. And so I just love being of service in that way. Mm, It's you're such a gift. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you so much with my whole heart, like such a gift. I really could continue talking about this because it's such a rich untilled conversation in our general narrative around death and grief. Like we just don't talk about it. And we, I'm going to say this last thing before we hop off, because in the Chinese medical system, the lungs are connected to grief. And so it's not lost on me that this pandemic, COVID-19, is happening and affecting certain places. Now, yes, there's government negligence. Yes, there's all these things. But there's it's a way that it's showing up in certain parts of the world. I think my very rough guesstimate is that there are a lot of places that are not grieving, that have not learned how to grieve, that have suppressed grief. And so our lungs are more vulnerable. Of course, this is, no one has said, no professional has come out with this theory, but this is my kind of just bringing different philosophies and theories together, thinking about thinking about it. Because if, it, if grief is reflected in the lungs and that's where COVID is living, 
I, I think that there's a lot of us who just need to be grieving. That is, that, that is so powerful. And I will say that I know that we're wrapping up, but like, actually it's so interesting because I have a, an acupuncturist who is, works in Chinese medicine. And so my endometriosis was in my lungs mm. and she's like, you know, that's so rare, but that's one of the things she said, like, where, what are you grieving? You know, like, what are you? And so that set me on my own personal journey because she was like, girl, when things show up in your lungs, like that, that's really serious. So what you said means a lot. I mean, it just, that clicked for me because that is where this is showing up for us. Thank you for being part of the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal. It's been an honor to have you in this sacred space. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe, review, and leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Your support helps other mystics just like you find our portal and community. Speaking of, if you'd like to stay connected and go even deeper, find me over on Instagram and say hi at Laren Alta, L-E-R-I-N-A-L-T-A. That's L-E-R-I-N-A-L-T-A. And so for now, we close this beautiful portal until we decide to meet again. Thank you so much for being here. So much love, signing off. Oh, today.